inquire all those questions you've always wanted to know. Ask Katie anything. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ask Katie Anything. I'm your host, licensed marriage and family therapist, Katie Morton. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, This week, oddly enough, I mean, we still had a ton of questions, but we didn't have as many as normal. So if you are new and you have a question that you're like, I hope that she picks it, now is your time. I think because the holidays are upon us, people aren't as active. So I think we only had like, I don't know, 30 or 40 questions. And usually we have, you know, like hundreds. So that was, uh, you know, might be your chance to slide one in. Um, but without further ado, let's jump to this week's first question. I think we have nine this week, by the way, just if you're tracking. Question number one says, hey, Katie, what is it like as a therapist to sit with someone while they're crying and hurting so much? Do you want to comfort them? Do you feel uneasy or do you become desensitized to it? I think most people's first response to seeing someone in distress would be to wrap their arms around them. It would seem so odd to be in therapy, so emotionally distressed with another person present in silence. What's your experience of this? And there was also a a couple of comments after this, but I'll get into that in a second. Now, I thought this was a great question because the truth is that part of therapy and part of what makes it so helpful and beneficial is aiding our patients in their, uh, I guess not, I don't want to call it comfortability because it's not comfortable, but aiding in our ability or growing the ability for us to sit with an emotion, experience it and be okay. And I know that that sounds really weird or maybe like hard to understand, But so often in life, we like run away from emotions. We like stuff them deep or we have more of like a secondary or responsive emotion, meaning we get like super angry or aggressive as a way to protect ourselves. And so, so much of our life, we do that. We stuff it down or we act out in another way to kind of offset what we're really feeling. And so a huge part of therapy is just to allow us to experience the real raw emotion and have the therapist be there and sit with you with it letting you know that it's okay. Now, as a therapist, along with, you know, um, sitting there, being with them, I also will validate and support and say things like, I know it must be hard, or I'm so sorry that you're going through this, but I don't talk too much because I don't want them to be distracted from what they're really feeling. And it's kind of this balance as a therapist to to sit, to support, but not to overdo it. And when it comes to like hugging or comforting, most of my patients, I guess due to past trauma and even eating disorders, it can make it really uncomfortable for people to touch your body because you're not really comfortable in your body. So for the most part, I do not touch a patient unless they ask for it or unless we've talked about it prior. Because usually my patients ahead of time will say like, I don't really want someone touching me or that's really triggering or or they might say, I really need that, right? But for the most part, I want you to be able to soothe yourself and I don't want you to have to lean on me to soothe you. Does that make sense? Not that I'm opposed to it. Because like I said, if a patient asked for it or said they needed it, I would offer it. But most of the time they don't. And it is uncomfortable, I guess, maybe the first couple of times you go through it. But being a therapist is weird, right? Because we learn how to sit with people, how to help them uh, identify their emotions, be able to express their emotions and feel free to be, right? Be themselves and be okay with it. And so a lot of our work is in that. And then if you are finally like crying in session or experiencing anger or frustration, to me, it's kind of a win. I'm like, good for you. Let yourself feel it. It's okay. You know, but I don't want to be invalidating. It's yes, it's a success. And I think someone left a comment that said that it or their therapist acted like it was a big success. And it is. And we get kind of excited in a weird way about it because we're like, yes, you're finally feeling it. Even though I know it feels shitty. It's not to say, yay, yay and yes are different, right? This is like, yes, you're finally allowing yourself to feel what you need to feel. And so it's kind of like a big win, but I will also just, you know, want to make sure that that you know you're supported and your feelings are valid. And so I, I may make a couple of comments, maybe like two to three max, where I would say, I understand you're upset. It's okay to let it out. This is a safe space. You know, I might say something like that or take your time with this. I'm here. It's okay to feel that way or it's okay to do, you know, I might say something like that, something kind of supportive, loving, encouraging, but I won't talk too much again because I don't want to distract from it. And the desensitized to it isn't what's happening. I mean, yes, I guess you could say that we're desensitized to 
hearing like really horrific stories in a lot of ways, because we've heard a ton of abuse stories, a ton of, um, I mean, I've heard a, a ton of abuse stories, a ton of eating disorder behavior that people are really embarrassed about or things that have happened to them. They think led to eating disorders. We've heard it all. And you do get kind of used to it, but I don't think that it's necessarily desensitized because we're still human and we still respond and react to the human condition and can feel really sad. Or, I mean, I've had, I don't know if I've actually done this in session. I can't remember a time when I did. So I would probably say no, but I do know one of my close friends who used to work at this domestic violence facility uh, had a patient once who shared something that made her cry. It was like so overwhelming for her to hear. And she apologized, but it was really, it was actually good for the patient. The patient felt, found it very uh, validating because she herself had a really hard time with what had happened. And so we're human. We might cry with you, um, but it's not very common, right? We're there to offer support and to let you know it's okay to feel how you feel. Now, there was a comment on this um, that says, also, why do I want my therapist to give me a hug and just hold me? I really feel needy and like a child, and I'm too scared to talk to her about it. My parents always hugged me as a child, so I don't think it's because of that. Just curious. Sometimes we want hugs, affirmations, because it's a human experience, right? It's incredibly common for that to be soothing. Your parents hugged you a lot as a child, so maybe that's the way that you like to be soothed. That could really be it. I know we talk a lot about like reading into things and make, you know, trying to get at the root of them, but sometimes the things that we need or the things that are upsetting are just things we need because we're human or just things that are upsetting because we're human. And in this case, that could just be it. It could also be just because, you know, I'm going to throw out some ideas and you have to tell me what resonates with you. But I think sometimes when we, when we really need to be hugged or we need to be physically supported by someone, it, like I said, could be what we're used to because our parents did it. It could be that our parents did that physicality, the physical kind of support, but no emotional support. And so we can try again and again, trying to get that need met using the same tools. And it might be not as fulfilling, but I don't know. Um, but my guess with this person who asked this question is that that's just how you're soothed. And that's what you need because your parents hugged you as a child. And so you want your therapist to hug you because that's the way that that's what feels good for you. Now, there was another comment said, additionally, is it normal for my mood to fluctuate a lot since I'm a fair, a fair bit into eating disorder recovery? I don't like being emotional in front of people. So it gets hard in therapy sessions to talk about being hopeful and happy one moment and then crying the next. Totally normal. Um, eating disorders are interesting. When we're in the depths of our eating disorder, our mood can fluctuate because food, whether we're eating a lot or not eating enough, can really affect how we feel. Not to mention the fact that eating disorders can be very overwhelming because they take up like 90% of our brain space, right? And so depending on how we're doing with food that day can definitely affect how we feel and how we interact with others. We can be really short-tempered. We can be nicer. It, you know, you, it runs a gamut. But when you're in the early parts of eating disorder recovery, it's like a battle of the selves. There's an eating disorder component of you that's like, why aren't you doing this? I need you to do this, like shouting, shouting, shouting about all the eating disorder behaviors that you should be engaging in. And then we have the healthy version of you, like your healthy voice. That's like, no, 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 I don't want to do that. And this battle can, number one, be extremely exhausting. And number two, it can definitely affect our mood depending on who's winning or even just the fact that the battle's going on at all. I mean, think about having that battle go on in your head day and night it's too much, right? Anybody would say, oh, that sounds like a lot. That sounds exhausting. It is. Trust me when I tell you it gets easier and it gets better, but it could cause these like emotional fluctuations and feeling dysregulated a lot. And I would encourage you to let your therapist know that this is happening. They probably already do, but I want you to tell them this is happening. This is what you're experiencing and see if uh, they can help you come up with some other ways to soothe your system. Because my guess is, it, it could be anything from like a full body shake to journaling or doing impulse logs. Anything like that could be helpful because what's happening is your emotions are feeling all over the place and you're so maxed out maybe because of the recovery and all the effort that it takes that you don't really have the resilience to like battle that fluctuation or that impulsiveness or that agitation or whatever you might be experiencing. And so let them know so they can give you or arm you with more tools to help you better manage it. Okay. Let's move on to question number two. Question number two says, hey, Katie, are therapists annoyed when clients have a hard time answering their questions? Good question. I'm worried that I respond with, I don't know, too often. 
And I'm concerned about the possibility of this hindering my progress or making my therapist think that I just am not trying hard enough. I feel as though I'm stuck on autopilot, like I'm barely even a person. And that makes therapy just feel like a really long version of one of those that I am not a robot test on the internet. (laughs) That's really funny to me. And my answers are based less on how I actually feel because I don't really know how I feel and more based off of how I think someone else would answer if they were in my shoes. What's going on and how can I do a better job of communicating? Couple things. I have one hypothesis I want to get out first before I forget it. And that is the urge to people please or to fawn. Um, Fawning is something that we do. It's It's like the fourth part of our stress response. It's essentially what we can, we try to extremely people please others in our lives or fawn over them so that they won't injure us again. It's like a way to kind of prevent abuse from continuing. That could be part of this, or it could be, you know, non-trauma related people pleasing where you're trying to do, you're trying to say what you think the right thing is to please the therapist. Now you didn't say that, but I'm just throwing it out there because I'm sure that some people do worry about that and therefore it can be really hard for them to answer because they don't know what a therapist wants them to answer because as a therapist, we don't have things we want you to, to answer. We just are trying to gauge, we're trying to get information from you really. And we don't know that information. So we're asking and that people pleasing urge can kind of get in the way sometimes of therapy being beneficial. Okay. Now, go to the top. Are we annoyed? No. Do we get annoyed with clients? Sometimes I'm being honest here. Sometimes if I have a patient who I know is lying to me or a patient who like legitimately isn't participating. Now I've only had this happen a couple of times. And when I say annoyed, it's more like it's because they're not helping themselves and, and I find it frustrating for them and it's a waste of their time and money. And then I feel kind of bad even seeing them. Right. And that's when I have to contemplate and try to talk to them about maybe pausing therapy for a second, or maybe they need to be referred to somebody different. Now that's not because I'm offended. It's not about me. It's about them and what this means about their treatment. And if a patient isn't even trying in session, like I had a patient, um, I saw him for a long time, but he, it would go because of his mental illness. He would go through these periods where he would just blatantly lie about everything. And I knew it because I knew him well enough. Right. And he would lie. And then inevitably his uh, roommate and partner would come in to sessions every so often and be like, that's not true at all. That's not what's happening. He did X, Y, or Z. And I'd be like, I had a feeling. Um, So he blatantly lie. He would show up extremely late to sessions sometimes. And often he wouldn't even want to participate. He'd be like, I don't know. I don't know. Or he'd bring food and want to eat during session and like not, and not an eating disorder patient, by the way, but he would just not want to talk. He'd be like, your mouth is full. Like you go. And I'm like, this isn't my therapy session. So that kind of stuff. And yeah, it's not really like annoyed as much as it is like, I think this is a waste of your time and money. And I feel like your treatment isn't going to, like treatment's not going to get better. You're not going to get better. We're kind of at this standstill. And so sometimes when a patient isn't trying, we contemplate whether it's really worth it for them or not. But when it comes to people saying, I don't know, or like having these long pauses and then being like, I'm not sure what I feel. We're used to that. That's part of therapy. It's really normal for people to not know. That doesn't mean you're not trying. That doesn't mean that, you know, we're getting frustrated. To me, it's like, it's a different puzzle. I'm trying to figure out how to get in. How will you let me in if I try this way or that way? Or what if I ask this question? Or what if we do it this way? I'm assessing different options and opportunities for me to get you to answer that maybe helps you feel more comfortable or you get less defensive, or maybe it's more like a psychoeducation component where we get to know what feelings are, right? How do they feel in our body? Should we look at a list of them and see if any of those resonate? What, where are we at? How can we start that? Because I never assume that a patient knows everything right away. I never assume a patient's always going to have the answers. I do know therapy in and of itself can be anxiety provoking or be you know, exhausting. And so we're going to work with you. It's not that, you know, we get annoyed. It's more about like what this means for you and your progress and process in therapy and how can we best assist. And if you're keeping us out and shutting down, you might not be ready for therapy yet. But if you're letting us in, but you just don't have the answer all the time, then that's, you know, it's just normal. And um, you said that you're concerned about this hindering your progress it could hinder your progress, right? If we don't have answers and we 
we don't know what to say and we aren't able to do the homework, it's going to take us a little longer. But I don't really think of it so much as like hindering your progress as being part of your process, right? We all need different amounts of time to get certain things done, especially in therapy, because everybody's different, right? Some of us grew up able to identify our emotions and we weren't stuffing them down. Well, good for you. That's going to make that part of therapy that much easier. Others of us had, you know, strange family dynamics, maybe where if we expressed any emotion, we were told to shut up or we were ridiculed or we, you know, uh, a parent tried to take the attention off of us and onto them. You know, I don't know what the situation could have been, but there's a lot of different reasons why we aren't aware of our emotions, able to healthfully express them. And it's probably part of the reason we're in therapy. And so just let your therapist know if you're able that this is happening. You could even read your question that you sent to me. You can be like, hey, there's this therapist on the internet. I'd asked this question and she told me I should ask it to you too and that we should talk about it. If you're able, because as a therapist, our, a lot of our job is just trying to finesse the right question to help you answer it so that you can feel better. Now, most people struggle to answer all the questions that we we ask. We're very used to it. But if you feel like you're never able to answer anything, we should talk with our therapist about this. And it might even be helpful. I've done this with adults and children to have an activity, meaning you color while you talk. Or I have a great game. It's called Totika. Uh, T-O-T-I-K-A, I think is how you spell it. You can get it on Amazon. Um, and it helps with talking and it can kind of take the edge off if dissociation is really common or if we struggle and we're like, I don't know. A lot of the questions aren't necessarily like therapy based, but they're, they are a little bit, you know, they're like, tell me about your best friend growing up, right? They can be any kind of uh, prompt to kind of get the conversation going. And those can sometimes help us m- manage or kind of navigate around these, I don't know, sections of our life because all all of us have them and those are all aids in ways that we can make it work anyway. Um, Yeah. So what's going on and how can I do a better job of communicating is the last part. Journaling can help with that too. Letting your therapist know that this is going on, even though they already know it can help just to talk about it, not to have the answers that, that you say, I don't know to, but to talk about it. Um, Yeah. And then journaling or writing things down, if that's helpful, that's another potential way. But I like games and things too. Those can be helpful. Bringing a coloring book and coloring while you talk, see if that helps. We can try different things. Um, But yeah, it's very normal to not know all the time. And your therapist is there to help you figure it out. Let's move on to question number three. This question says, hi, Katie, thank you for your advice before about showing emotions. Of course, I'm glad it was helpful. My question is about canceling therapy sessions when I'm feeling the worst or get bad news so common. For example, I got bad news about my husband and his back injury and him not getting back to work anytime soon. I felt so overwhelmed, but I didn't really show any emotion. And my first instinct is to isolate and just deal with it myself. I ended up canceling two weeks of therapy because I just don't want to be around people or discuss how I'm feeling. Interesting. I put my phone on silent for a few days and just ignored everyone. Is this normal? Is it okay to deal with things this way? Yes, it's entirely normal. Um, When we feel overwhelmed, my guess would be, just a side note, that you are what I would call toxically independent. And I say that with love because I can be this way too, where you're like, I can't trust anybody else. I can't count on anybody else. I can count on me. So I'm going to isolate. I'm going to process this on my own, do my own thing or stuff it down on my own and move through. And this can happen for a lot of reasons. This can happen because we were a parentified child. So we've always been the adult. It could happen because our parents were emotionally neglectful. Maybe they worked away from home or they weren't there. It could be because, you know, others have let us down in our life, friends, family, anybody else not showing up for us. So we can think I could only count on me. We could have like anxious attachment. So if our parents didn't, you know, respond to us that well, when we were growing up, when we were really little, we can feel like we want people close, but then we don't, we can't really trust them to take care of us or be there for us. Um, all of those things can relate to why this is happening. And also if we grew up in an environment where it wasn't okay to be needy or to act, you know, to say that we needed support, or maybe we were told that we were too much or we were too sensitive or whatever, we can internalize that. And take it into adulthood. And then even when it comes to our therapist, we don't want to open up to them because we're like, I'm going to be too much of a burden. Or we're like, I don't know how they're going to respond or react to this. And that could be more wounding to me. Um, 
Yeah, there can be a lot of reasons that we we tuck it deep and we think that we can only deal with it ourselves. And I would just encourage you to be curious about this, not judgmental, because it comes from a certain place. Like I said, it could come from attachment. It could come from emotionally absent parents and abuse growing up. It could come from being a parentified child. It could come from uh, being a people pleaser and not wanting to put it on into, onto anybody else or be a burden, right? We can have all of these thoughts and all these beliefs around what it means to lean onto others or what it means to express upset or discontent or overwhelm. Be curious about what you associate with those words that I just said needing someone, needing to reach out for help, getting support, right? Leaning on someone else when you need it. Like, what do you think about Because you might even have these thoughts where you're like, well, it's fine for other people, but not for me, right? We can have all these different beliefs. So be curious, not judgmental about where this is coming from. It's totally normal. You're not alone. There were a ton of thumbs ups on this question. A lot of comments below where people said, yeah, me too. That my first instinct is always to cancel my sessions. Um, I've had tons of patients try to do this. They go into crisis and they cancel and I won't let them. (laughs) And I don't mean I won't let them. Like if they really can't come, they're not going to come. But I will say, I'm going to hold that hour for you because I'd really like to see you because I think you probably really need it. And I don't think I've ever had someone not show up. So Sometimes we just need someone to tell us it's okay. And if that's the case for you, let your therapist know this is happening. Um, because it's really not like, quote unquote, okay to deal with things this way. That's the last part of this question, because that proves to our brain and our nervous system over and over again, that we can only count on us, that only you can take care of you. And that's a pretty big burden to carry, right? Especially when we care for other people, it needs to be shared. What's the old adage? It's like, um, with, with people in your life or with love in your life, every joy is doubled and every burden is halved. I need you to have it, right? Because you're taking the half for other people, I would assume. And for some reason, you don't think it's okay for you to give that other half to people and you prefer to isolate. Um, where does that discomfort come from? Another thought that just bubbled up is like, maybe you're uncomfortable showing emotion to anybody. Are you okay crying in front of people or being overwhelmed? Do you ever tell anybody when you're having a hard time? Maybe not. So the thought of going into therapy and doing it, you're like, no, 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 no. Um, Be curious about this. And I would encourage you strongly, make an appointment, tell your therapist that this is happening and talk about it, figure it out because it comes from somewhere. One, Hopefully one of the things I mentioned kind of triggers something and you're like, oh my God, yeah, it like rings true. And then again, not judgmental, but just be curious. When did this start? Is this something that my mom or dad used to do? Is this the dynamic in my family? Was I told that I was too much or too sensitive or too whatever growing up? Like, where does this come from? Because it comes from somewhere and it's not the best thing to do because that's what therapists and therapy is really there for is to support you when you have a shitty time. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, we want to see you. We want to help understand what happened, give you more tools to better manage it and help you talk it out and process what took place, you know? Okay, let's move on to question number four. This question says, hi, Katie, why do I behave so childlike when we talk about trauma in session? Interesting. I don't feel like I have control over it. Wasting my time as I cease to function and speak. My therapist said that I'm resistant, but I can't help it. I do struggle with dissociation too. And right now it feels like trauma therapy is going nowhere. Somebody commented, yes. Also in a more general sense, why do people in general, yes, me, at times behave speak or nonverbal behavior, et cetera, like a child, not particularly bound to a heavy trauma session. This can feel more like I have no control, but at the same time, somewhat nice and calming. Interesting. Okay. So the first component about this happening in a trauma session, my immediate gut response is like, oh, you must've had trauma in childhood. And the reason that you're acting childlike is because sometimes for many of us, when we are traumatized at a young age, we're kind of in many ways developmentally arrested at that age, meaning that probably emotionally, and this usually mainly relates to difficulties. So if we have arguments with loved ones, difficulties in relationships or something that's super triggering, when that stuff happens, we revert back to where we were emotionally when we were last upset or overwhelmed, which is child. And we go back into that. And often because of that trauma, we haven't had any practice engaging in difficult conversations and situations as an adult. We always revert back to that child self because frankly, 
we, because of the trauma, we haven't felt safe enough or okay enough to even work to develop our emotional intelligence or our ability to not dissociate, not get overwhelmed and to stay in difficult conversations. Frankly, we aren't able, like we don't have the capability, right? If we've been harmed that way as a child, it can be really hard for us to think that it's going to be safe or okay to engage like that. Because probably the last time someone raised their voice or got upset with us, we were abused. So when we go into, you know, trauma sessions with our therapist and doing that intensive, hard trauma work, we can revert right back. And that's kind of one of the reasons. Another and kind of connected in the same way is that when trauma happens to us as a child and we start talking about that, we almost can't help but go back into that mindset of that younger us. And that's why inner child work is so key and so healing is because oftentimes we're acting out of that frame of mind because we haven't been able to develop any other way, right? And when we talk about that specific scenario, we can't help but get pulled back into that way of talking, acting, engaging. I used to have a patient who would do like baby talk with me when she would talk about trauma. And that was one of the things she hated because it was like, it actually ruined some of her relationships. Her boyfriend thought it was really weird. When they would get into arguments, she would kind of do some baby talk stuff and she was trying to stop it. But it was because she, you know, she was abused throughout her childhood off and on for years and years. And so just know that it can be, it's really common can be hard for a lot of us and doing some inner child work. I actually have an inner child workshop that's available on my website. Um, it was live. I did it in September, I think, but we recorded it and it's available for you there if you'd like to engage. And I also, you know, have worksheets and books that I recommend and all sorts of information and resources so that it's helpful. And I have tons of videos about it too. If you can't afford something or don't have the time for something like a workshop, I have free videos on YouTube. Just search, you know, inner child, Katie Morton, they'll come up. Um, okay. Now your therapist is saying that you're resistant and it, it's probably true because it's triggering. And so if you're able, we're going to have to find ways to regulate or to calm you. This could be rocking. I've had lots of patients where when they rock in a chair, they, they feel soothed. We can do a full body shake. Maybe we have silly putty in our hand or a fidget toy that helps some people. We could do some breathing exercises where we like almost like Lamaze, or we can do like slow breathing, breathe in for four, hold for four, out for four. We can do some things like that. Um, we're going to, you might want to, I don't know, scream or kick, kick your feet, especially if you're feeling childlike. Can we throw a tantrum? Talk to your therapist and try to find ways to get you out of that because it's happening as a result of you being triggered. And so your defenses are to act childlike and to be really resistant but you don't feel like it's a choice because it's really, it's not a conscious choice. It's like, it's happening. It's almost like a knee jerk reaction, right? Your body's just reacting to what it is experiencing emotionally. And so I would ask your therapist about this because you said you struggle with dissociation too. And trauma therapy probably isn't going anywhere because we're not able to be present and hang. And so instead of continuing to trying to move forward this way, because it's not working, my encouragement to you would be to do some more of the resourcing, meaning coming up with other ways to calm your system down when you start to feel overwhelmed and even just understanding your levels of overwhelm before we get to childlike behavior or dissociation, right? There's there's a buildup. We just aren't acknowledging it because we haven't tried to tap in and pay attention. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Yes, it takes practice, but it will get better and it gets we get faster at doing it, okay? Now, in a more general sense, to get into that person's question, we can act childlike Again, going back to what I said about like the developmentally arrested in a childlike state, that could be, I'd assume you still have trauma. I feel like the only reason, and I know this is like a very big statement to make, but like 90% of the time, the reason we're acting childlike is because of childhood trauma. We're developmentally arrested in some way at that age, or we think that talking and acting in a childlike way gets us what we want because that's the only way we knew how to get our needs met as a child. It can be kind of a manipulation that we learned because we were neglected, right? It's always abuse in my mind. Um, I've never met a, a person who's an adult who doesn't have childhood emotional neglect or abuse or something speak in baby language or talk like that to other adults in situations where it, you know, it's not, it's not like we're talking to a dog or a baby. 
we're talking adult to adult. The only times I've seen that happen is due to trauma and abuse. And so that's really why it can happen. And the reason that it's happening when it's happening for you is that you're triggered because it doesn't have to be tied to any trauma session for anybody. It's usually we're triggered in some way. And you know, that that's forcing you kind of back into that old way of interacting, frankly, because we don't have any practice or any understanding on how to do it differently because we've never been able to develop that muscle to grow in, you know, be a kid where you, you're like, treat me like an adult, you know, like teenager or tween where you fight with your parents and you want independence. We never had the freedom to do that. We never had, you know, teenage breakups or early twenties where you date somebody and you're like, Ugh, and you get into a fight and you, even though you're, you're acting your age, we've never had an opportunity to do that because we've always felt like it wasn't safe. And the only way we know how to interact or to react is as a child. And that's probably also why it's kind of calming. Both of these just tell me that like inner child work is going to be part of your therapeutic process because that nice and calming part is it probably because it's like something that you're really comfortable in acting like a child feels very comfortable, very calming. Being an adult, an adult maybe can feel very overwhelming. We can feel very dysregulated a lot and going back to an old version of ourselves can, because we've done that probably over and over and over for years and years and years, it can feel kind of good. It's comfortable. We know it, right? We're used to it. And so that's probably why you're experiencing that. Okay. Let's move on to question number five. This question says, hi, Katie, happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. It says, I'm wondering how can you respect and honor your past without being completely engulfed or invalidating? It seems no matter how I look at it, my past was traumatic. And at the same time, I don't know how to admit it was traumatic without feeling like I'm being over dramatic. At the same time, I feel like I need to accept and not downplay it. I don't want to be defined by the things that have happened, but then they did happen. And I feel like I'm neglecting a part of me when I don't acknowledge the plethora of things. I've tried bridge statements, but somehow those even feel fake or invalidating or over dramatic. Scheduling a time or setting a timer to cry or to laugh or to go through emotions just doesn't work. I feel at times like I need to just get over my feelings, but at the same time, I think I need to fully feel everything for weeks. I want to be authentically happy, but it just doesn't seem possible. I don't know. Um, I don't want to be a downer either. I really just need to figure out how to be. <laughs> I'm in therapy and I suffer from PTSD, depression, and anxiety. And I hope this makes sense. Yes, this totally makes sense. Um, hmm. If you were my patient, I, I, so what's happening here? Let, let's start there. What's happening here is all or nothing, black and white thinking. We either respect and honor our past or we're engulfed in it. Or we, I guess we can be invalidating it, right? So we, it's like all or nothing, we're either in or we're out. And so we're trying to find that balance in the middle. And my, my gut is to first find ways to help you soothe your system and remind you that you're okay. Not safe, not unsafe, just like neutral. We need to find a way to help you feel like we're going to be okay. This kind of neutral space. Now, it might take you a while to find that neutral space because I have a feeling what's happening is we're getting so triggered by acknowledging and honoring our past that we can't even stay present in that without being completely dysregulated and engulfed with it. And so the only other option we feel is just like shut it down and be invalidating. And so I want you to have some ways to calm your system down or to soothe your system in that in-between space as we move towards kind of that validating respect and honor portion. It's hard to do what you're asking yourself to do. So be patient with yourself. I know it sounds, it can sound simple in language, but it's difficult in the emotional work, right? Because we don't really know how to acknowledge that what happened happened and validate that and not be completely triggered and want to shut down. And then, then we can feel like I'm being too much. This is, and maybe our whole life we've been told that we're too sensitive. We're too much. We ask for all this stuff, right? We might've been told that forever. And so that belief about us is that we're just always too much. This is always going to be too much. You're too sensitive. You're overreacting. And so we take that to heart. And when we're trying to even tiptoe into the like acknowledgement space of trauma to be like, yes, what happened was abuse immediately our knee jerk innate response is like, you're being dramatic. You're being too much, right? Because that's kind of the story we've told ourselves over and over again, which is probably why, you know, bridge statements and things like that. I, I probably recommended them because they can help, 
but not yet because we don't have any way to calm our system down. It's, it, we have no middle ground. We go from one extreme to the next. We almost like jump over this middle. And so what I want you to focus on right now is to put together a list from zero to 10, almost like we're doing exposure therapy, a zero to 10 of the things that might be triggering. And even writing this list might be triggering. You might want to do it with your therapist, but zero are the things that don't bother you at all about your past. So maybe it's like, um, starting at 10 years old, I'm good. Or, you know, things that involve my brother and I hanging out, those are fine. I don't know, but you, you know, you, and then moving up, maybe it's like things where my brother and I were, were outside with my dad starts to get a little shady things that were my brother and I were outside as my dad and my uncle bad, you know, and I don't know, I'm just making things up. But if you can try to put together kind of a hierarchy of things that are overwhelming, stressful, max you out, like all the way from relax to max you out, dissociate, maybe try to do that. And again, do it with your therapist if you find this too triggering. Um, and also, and probably actually first, we should come up with some resources or some tools to help you calm down when you feel overwhelmed. And we can do, there are two types of tools. There are coping skills that help you process and there are coping skills that help you distract. And the coping skills that help you process are things like journaling, uh, talking with a therapist, speaking with a family member honestly, or doing an impulse log, anything that's like process-based and helps you actually acknowledge your feelings and write them out and get through them, essentially process them. The other side are the more distraction-based, like go for a walk, organize a part of your room, make yourself a healthy meal, watch a TV show. We can, you know, paint your nails. We can do any number of things to distract. Um, and I have a video. If you look up 25 coping skills, Katie Morton on YouTube, it'll come up not only do I offer 24 in the video, but then I ask everyone to leave them in the comments for number 25. And so the comments are filled with a ton of wonderful coping skills. So head over there and find some that will work for you because we're not, otherwise we're not gonna be able to find that gray middle zone. We're going from black to white. We're going from either respecting and honoring or being, um, you know, overwhelmed and invalidating it. Right. And I want you to find that middle where you can do the, honoring and respecting while also acknowledging, you know, how hard it was. You can hang out in that, that healthy space where we can actually do the work and start to feel better. Okay. I hope that that helps. Let me know. And I know the crying, the timer and stuff isn't going to work because I, I think you're, you're resistant to it because of that, that belief that you're over, that you're too much, you're too sensitive, all that stuff. So let's try that and let me know. Okay. There was a comment on this says to add on, I started talking a bit about my childhood experiences in therapy, which leads to more thoughts, more memories popping up. And I'm wondering how it helps me in the now, if I talk about the past and potentially acknowledge that it was traumatizing, how can I use such insights into where my struggles originated from to help me change the present? I'm not sure, or I'm just not sure like the person above, whether I should acknowledge it, talk about it in therapy, et cetera, or if it's better to just leave it behind. Okay. Now, it's kind of normal for us. I've talked about this and used this analogy before, but I think it really, really works here. If you ever watched Friends, Monica Geller is like this super clean freak, OCD, anxious type of character, okay? And she has this one closet in her apartment. Her apartment's usually very well put together and clean for the most part. This closet is like the closet nobody opens is because where she puts stuff, she doesn't know what to deal with. And it's just like a disaster and she just likes to keep it shut. Well... It gets opened and shit falls out of it and she's embarrassed and she's overwhelmed and she hates it. That's what's happened to you is you have this one closet where you've put all your trauma and all your upsets and all your worries and you shove it in that closet and you shut the door. And then you go into therapy and your therapist opens up the closet and is like, okay, well, let's clean this out. Let's organize this. And you're like, oh my God, the memories keep coming, right? You thought it was just what you could see when you opened the closet door, but you forgot all the stuff tucked away in the back. So what you're experiencing is incredibly normal and unfortunately is part of the process. And so what I would, uh, my encouragement for you would be like I talk, told the first person, come up with some coping skills because it does get overwhelming. Unfortunately, that's just part of the process, but then let your therapist know this is happening. Let them know it's overwhelming. You might just be going too fast in therapy. We need to like slow things down so that we don't feel so overwhelmed as all these other memories pop up. And a, a really cool trick or tip that I do with my patients is called putting together a trauma timeline because when we start to feel like things are just coming up and oh my god I'm having all these memories and all these things that I, I didn't know happened or I forgot 
it could feel very scattered and like this messy ball of yarn. But if we straighten it out and put it on a timeline, like, okay, I think this happened when I was six. I think this happened when I was 10, 12, right? We can start putting things together or it might be like, I think a bunch happened right here. It sounds kind of simple because it is, but it's incredibly effective for helping make sense of like all these memories that we can feel keep popping up. And then we don't, our, it's a weird thing about our brain where if we don't like write it down and talk it out, it feels the need to continue to remind us almost so that we, because it really wants us to process it. It's like, Hey, I remember this. This is overwhelming. Can we work on this? And it keeps trying to tell us. And so if we can write it down and get it like out of our head for some reason, it stops that rumination. And so maybe try a ta- trauma timeline as well. Cause I think that might help you kind of make sense as you feel like so many memories are popping up and it just starts to feel overwhelming. I want you to know that it is all manageable. What you're experiencing is very normal. Sometimes we just have to put it in a place where we can see it and we can also move things around. You know, it's a living document. It's not like once you write that line, it has to happen then. And it has to have been when we were nine. It's very common for us to remember another trauma and be like, oh, that means that one happened right there. You know, we can make sense of it then. So maybe do that. And it doesn't have to be a trauma time. Like you said, childhood experiences. It could just be things you remember. As you see, these memories keep popping up, make a memory timeline of it as much as you can remember. And that can kind of help us slow it down. Let your therapist know this is happening. And yeah, you'll get through it. And you asked, how can I use such insights into where my struggles originated to help me change the present right now? Let's just get to a place where we write them out and kind of put them on these timelines, whether it was a trauma or just an experience and a memory that isn't, doesn't connect connected to a trauma. Let's try to make sense of that first. That's kind of part of that acknowledgement process and that understanding of what a trauma is. You can let your therapist know you're struggling with that too, and they can help validate along the way. But also when it comes to, you know, using those insights to better understand where your struggles came from, that's going to happen as this work is done. It's not like we have to decide what we're going to do. As we start to see things, you know, lining up, your therapist is going to ask you about those relationships or those situations. And as much as you're able at the time, you talk through them and you start to kind of see whether we want to or not, unfortunately, why we are the way we are, why we act the way we act, right? If we never really felt safe with a man, maybe that's why we're still struggling with intimate relationships with men. If our parents only yelled at each other and that's how they communicated, that could explain why we really are afraid of conflict or maybe why that's the only way we know how to fight, right? As you kind of put together these things, you can start to see the patterns and you can see maybe how it's affecting you today, but we have to get it out there first. We have to put it on that timeline or put it in a journal so that we can kind of stop it from spinning faster and faster and faster in our head and feeling overwhelming. Okay. I hope that makes sense. And no, it's not better to just leave it behind. It'll keep coming back, like knocking, like scratching to try to get out because our brain wants to make sense of what happened. We need to give it an opportunity to do that. Let's move on to question number six. This question says, hi, Katie. My therapist wants me to sign a no suicide, a no self-harm contract because of how I've been feeling lately. I understand from her perspective while she feels that she might need this. But for me, since she suggested doing this, it feels like I'm I'm failing and that I'm being too much. Well, that's not at all what's happening, but we'll talk about it. It feels like me being too much has made her feel the need to do this, which now makes me feel like pulling back and masking myself again. I'm curious, have you been told in your life a lot that you are too much, that you're overwhelming, you demand too much, that you're too sensitive? I think something's triggered here. Okay. I know this might just be the trauma brain talking. Yeah but I just don't know how I feel about it. I also ignore, oh, it also ignites my trust issues because I feel like signing it will mean that I agree with her calling someone on me if she makes that judgment about me and my safety at any time. I've even gotten to the point where I'm thinking about quitting therapy altogether, but I don't want to keep repeating old patterns. I feel stuck and I don't know what to do. Okay. Now, um, random side note, uh, there's some research, not a ton, but some research to prove that these contracts don't really help at all, but I have found them to be incredibly beneficial with my patients, which is why I always do them, which is why your therapist is doing them. Because like you, most of my patients take it pretty seriously and consider like, okay, yes, I commit to doing this. Let your therapist know of the issues that you have, especially the trust ones. Now, I personally don't have on my suicide self-harm contract that I would call someone 
that's part of their informed consent and something they've signed way before. And I would talk to them about it before we ever got to that point. So talk to your therapist about your concerns there. Ask them what would have to happen for them to reach out to someone you love, because you need to know when they might do that so that you feel like you're in control of your own confidentiality, which is very important. And ethically and legally, we can't reach out to someone unless we actually think there's an imminent threat. And, you know, that's the only way we, because you're not responding. Now, that's the only reason that I would do it is if my patient doesn't respond and I think that they're in imminent danger, I would, that's when I would do that. This is just steps in our kind of like safety process. Okay. So let your therapist know you're worried about that. And them wanting you to do this is actually just their way of keeping you safe. It's just because they're worried about your safety. It's nothing more. It's nothing less. It doesn't mean you're too much. We do this with patients all the time. That's why I've talked about it so many times on here. That's something, honestly, also I specialize in self-injury. So almost all of my patients have some kind of, you know, safety contract with me because they struggle with self-harm. And I want to make sure that if something gets infected, if they injure themselves so much, they need to go to the hospital that they tell me and that we have a plan in place. Or if they do consider taking their own life, we have a plan in place, right? And so it actually means almost the opposite of what you're experiencing. We're, we're getting triggered. We think that it means we're too much. And I'm just here to tell you, it's just because they're concerned about your safety it has nothing to do with you being too little or too much. You're just the right amount. You're just having a hard time and it's a therapist's job to help support that and keep you safe. But we've been triggered. And so I would encourage you to, if you can't bring it up with your therapist right now, I understand, but maybe we at least journal about where we think this comes from. Like I said earlier, you know, you've probably been told your whole life that you're too much, you're oversensitive, you're overreacting, you know, you, you're too demanding or something like that. Where did that come from? Who told you that? How often did you hear that? What, when did you hear that? Like, what was it in relation to? Take some time and be curious about that for yourself because we've internalized these messages from our parents or people in our family or whatever. And right now we're acting out of them. Our therapist expressing concern and wanting to keep us safe has triggered us. We're like, the fuck you are. I don't want to sign this. Now I don't even know if I trust you. And you quitting and not signing this are actually just, like you said, repeating these old patterns. And that's not what we want to do. But we need to be curious about this intense reaction you're having of like, no, you know, I want you to be curious about that so that we can move through this and it can be a growing and healing experience rather than what has probably been in the past, which is like a re-injury or like ripping open the sutures again, right? So that our wounds won't heal right. And so be curious. If you can tell your therapist about it, tell your therapist about it. Otherwise, start journaling, start digging into this. And it might even be a place for what I call opposite action, which we do in dialectical behavior therapy or DBT, where we do the opposite of what our urge is. So your urge is to quit therapy. Maybe we increase sessions because we're having a hard time. Our urge is to not sign the contract. Maybe we sign it. And I know opposite action is hard. We have to like white knuckle it and just do it. But it can sometimes help us see that that concern, that worry, that anxiety, that build up thinking oh my God, this is going to be too much. It's going to break my trust. We're making all these assumptions about it, right? About ourselves, about other people, about the experience as a whole. And by doing the opposite thing, we can prove to ourselves that it's okay. But please let your therapist know about this. Please tell them that you're feeling this way. It's okay. We've dealt with it before and they sound like they're doing a good job. They're going to meet you there. They're going to support you. Okay. Just hang in there. You're not stuck. We will find a way to get you out of this old pattern. It just takes practice. And the fact you're even acknowledging that it's an old pattern is a huge step. So kudos. It's amazing. We'll get there. Okay. Let's move on to question number seven. This question says, Katie, is it possible to be traumatized by being mentally ill? Yes. I'll talk about that. I've had depression for four years before I was diagnosed, but shortly before I went to the therapist, I completely hit rock bottom. I couldn't write important emails anymore. I couldn't even read a full sentence. And on top of that, I started seeing things that weren't there. We can have psychosis as a result of depression. People don't talk about that enough. I'm technically recovered now in the sense that I don't have symptoms anymore. But as soon as my mood drops a bit, I'm afraid I'm going to start seeing things again. And I take a lot longer to write emails and respond to them because I'm somehow afraid now. Before, I used to answer emails straight away. This is a great question. And Yes, we can be traumatized by being mentally ill in the same way we can be traumatized by being physically ill, right? An illness is an illness and it can feel out of control, especially when we talk about depression and psychosis. 
I've had patients with schizophrenia or psychosis as part of their bipolar disorder, their depression, their anxiety, you name it. It can be fucking terrifying. It can feel um, like everybody's out to get us. Scary. We can think that we're at risk of being harmed by someone or something. Terrifying again. We can wonder what the fuck is happening and why our brain is playing tricks on us terrifying again. And remember the like the criteria or really the characterization of what it means to be traumatized is that we have to fear for the life of ourselves or someone else, right? We we worry about our own safety and seeing something that's not there or being severely mentally ill, meaning having like a really deep bout of depression. And I'm not saying deep that like, oh, you have moderate depression. You can't have trauma. You can't be traumatized. No, I'm not ranking anything. I'm just saying that when we go into these bouts of a mental illness, it can feel very terrifying. We can feel like we're not even in control of who we are, what we might do or not do. It's scary. So yes, you can be traumatized by it. Especially, I find it be incredibly common in my patients who, like I said, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, but even my bipolar patients, I would argue have been traumatized. It kind of just depends on, again, how you, what your experience is, and what your reaction to it was. If you feared for your own safety, yes. And my encouragement to you would be to do the things you're kind of scared of. Remember exposure therapy is like the best treatment for PTSD. I would encourage you to, you know, start writing emails more quickly. When your mood drops, I'd encourage you, you know, um, to go out and see people more and do more things, kind of the opposite of probably what a little opposite action, the opposite of what you might want to do. Um, and just consider those things that you might not be doing because of your PTSD, because what I don't want to happen is because you were traumatized, I want your world to keep getting smaller where you feel like you can't engage in a way that you want. So we're going to push back a little bit in the places where it feels okay and make sure that you have some ways to kind of soothe your system, remind yourself you're okay and keep going. So, you know, things like answering emails or maybe being in public, I don't know if it's social, you know, I don't know how it's shown up for you and other than the two examples you gave, but if there are others, I want you to start engaging in those little by little, knowing that you're going to be okay. So we're kind of pushing back against that urge to isolate or that urge to, to not respond and to kind of go inside so that we don't have something happen again. Um, yeah, it gets better. I'm glad that you're treated. Also, we have proof almost, you know, like the fact that you have treatment, you haven't had it happen again. Chances of it coming back are slim. If you stay on your medication, take care of yourself, right? It's, I know it sucks. I know it's scary, but yes, unfortunately we can be traumatized and illness is an illness, right? And mental illness, I would argue, have even probably a higher likelihood of traumatizing us because it can feel out of control. You know what I mean? I guess physical illness are out of control too. Like if you have cancer, you're like, I don't know how to treat, you know, it's out of our control. So yeah, unfortunately it's very common. Okay, let's move on to question number eight. This question says, hi, Katie. My therapist told me that quote unquote therapy is not a weight loss program. Agreed. What does this mean? I'm overweight and I'm trying to get help with my habits of overeating and binging and I want to lose weight. Is she saying that therapy cannot help me do this? She said there are plenty of weight loss programs out there, almost to suggest that I use one of those instead. But all I've seen out there is basically calorie counting, which sucks. And I was really hopeful that tackling my bad habits through therapy would be a more sustainable approach and one that would make me less miserable in the process of losing weight. I am less hopeful now that she said this. What do I do? Okay. I think we have a communication problem and I almost hate that your therapist said this, but I'm, uh, I don't think I would have said it like this, but I agree with her. Now I know you want to lose weight, but when it comes to therapy, the goal is not to gain or lose weight. Those aren't our goals. Our goal is to understand your emotional connection with food and your relationship with food and why we're where we are now. Does that make sense? And so part of what therapy is, is like healing that relationship between yourself and your body because we're disconnected and we're using food to cope in some way. And so therapy is not a weight loss program. It's not gonna make you count calories. I'm surprised that she, you, I don't know what's happening in session, I'm surprised she said that there are plenty of weight loss programs out there. I don't know if you're pushing back against some of the like therapeutic components or you're wanting to know why you're not losing weight right away. Spoilers, you're probably not going to for a little while because it takes a, a while for us to understand our relationship with food. That's why diets don't work, you guys, is they never treat the real problem. They just give us some ridiculous kind of like plan 
And of course you can't follow it forever because it's super restrictive and it's not healthy and it doesn't account for the fact that when we're stressed out, hello, holidays are coming, when we're feeling overwhelmed in any way, when we feel emotions that we don't like, when we uh, maybe see people that remind us of a certain time in our life, we eat or we don't eat, right? We It doesn't acknowledge all of the pieces to that relationship we have with our body and food. We just it doesn't. And so that's why therapy is not a weight loss program. Could you lose weight as a result of improving your relationship with food? 100%. Is that the goal? Not at all. I would never write that goal on my patients in my patient's file. That would never be a goal to gain or lose weight. I mean, in eating disorder space, I guess if you're in a treatment program, they might have that. Uh, No, we still don't have it though. I mean, they might say weight restored or Uh, back into weight range or things like that, I guess. But still, that's not the real goal. The goal is to figure out why this eating disorder exists. And I know you're probably thinking, well, I wouldn't call an eating disorder. I might, right? If, If you're feeling like you have these bad habits of overeating and binging and you've tried to manage them before and they feel out of control, I'd wonder if maybe we struggle with binge eating disorder or maybe we struggle with bulimia. I don't know what behaviors you know you're struggling with, but therapy can help you. I don't know if she's an eating disorder specialist, but if she is, I would encourage you to continue seeing her or to find someone who is. I'd also encourage you if you if you f- feel good about it, it's a great book to read. You can read it on your own. It's called Eating in the Light of the Moon. And you can find it on my Amazon shopping. Just go to amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Katie Morton. It's in there. Um, when you guys buy stuff through there, I get like a kickback, like 2% or something. I get like 50 cents. So I don't care if you buy it from there or not, but sometimes it's easier just to go into there. Um, so... That's a great book to kind of help start the reconnection between brain and body or kind of like ourselves and food. It starts just kind of bringing us back together. I think it's a really, really beautiful book. Um, I personally have loved it and read it many times and I encourage a lot of people to read it. Okay, so um, I'm less hopeful now that she said, what do I do? I'd let her know that that's upsetting. Um, I would let her know that, you know, your goal, your goal is to lose weight, but you understand, well, I don't know if you do understand this. I hope what I said, I guess, resonates and you understand why she may have said it. And I think seeing an eating disorder specialist would be important and key. And I would encourage you to maybe stop focusing all of your energy on losing weight. I know that goes against everything that you think or know, but I'm here to tell you that it's actually not about that. It's about your relationship with food and we need to repair that and we need to better understand it. And so give yourself the time to do that work. And that's where therapy really is healing. Because the cool thing about therapy is that when we start doing the real work and understanding why our eating disorder exists, the urge to restrict or binge or purge will slowly go away because we'll have other ways to cope. It'll be hard. It's not the easiest thing. Also, when we have a slip up, we realize it's just a slip up and we don't want to turn it into like a spiral, right? Like, oh, I binged again or oh, I restricted again or oh, I did this again. It's a one time. Okay, I get back up. I understand why I did that. And we don't fall back into those old patterns over and over and over and over and over again and like spiral out, right? And so it's, I wish it was easy, I wish I could tell you, well, yes, therapy is a weight loss program. We can tell you that. No, anybody who tells you that is lying. We have to change our relationship with food and that takes time. And I hope that she's like eating disorder informed at least or eating disorder specialist because that will be ideal. Now, there was a comment on this. I hope this is okay as a follow-up. I have problems with binge eating and emotional eating. The same thing, by the way. I've not talked to my therapist about this yet. We are working on the trauma from abuse. Do we need to specifically work on my eating disorder or will that be addressed in dealing with the trauma? I think I know the answer. You need to let her know that this is happening. Please, pretty please. And yes, I would assume your binge eating is a way to cope with the emotions or the experience of the trauma. And so it is very connected, but we're not. it's not just gonna go away on its own by treating the trauma. We still have to acknowledge the eating disorder and work against it. We're going to have to have other coping skills to replace it. It doesn't, unfortunately, just go away on its own. So let your therapist know, please, please, please. I'm pretty sure that's what you thought my answer was going to be. Sorry to, you know, let you down that way. Um, but the tra- working on the trauma will help and it might increase the urges and then slow, like lower them. 
But in order to get an eating disorder to go away, we have to face it head on. I wish there was a way to be like, you know what? We can just ignore it, work on the root issue and it'll go away. That's not the, not the case, unfortunately. It will, like I said, get worse and then they'll get a little better, but it'll still hang around. And when anything stressful happens, you'll turn to that coping skill. And so what we need to do is snuff it out completely by replacing it with others. Yes, I know that others aren't as good as it. It takes a while and it sucks. And it's like, get to white knuckle and push through. But trust me when I tell you, you can overcome it and it does get better. Okay. Final question. Question number nine says, Heidi Ho, Katie, Heidi Ho. I feel like I have so many questions to ask. It's difficult to pinpoint which one to take the plunge with. Since you're a marriage and family therapist, I'm going to go in the direction of my husband and I's relationship. We've always struggled in the bedroom. I feel like he would rather not be intimate with me. So I have put up walls, but I want him to be the initiator if it does happen. Totally understand. But I feel uncertain of what to do when he does. We've been married for 24 years. Ooh, he has been unfaithful to me, although he says he's never physically cheated. I have terrible self-esteem issues and I struggle with my weight, yo-yo dieting for years. I almost feel like once I lose weight and feel better, I need to put the weight back on. Does that sound crazy? I do have a history of childhood sexual abuse, but I never felt like it was an issue until I started listening to you and questioning if maybe that could be a part of the problem. How can I sort out the root of the problem and finally get our marriage on track? And him and my self-esteem and weight, my child sexual abuse, all of the above. I know this is kind of all over the place. I hope you get the idea of where I'm going with this. Thanks for all you do. You make the idea of therapy not so scary. I'm so glad. That makes me feel really good. Now, the reason you probably feel the need, it doesn't sound crazy that you feel the need to put the weight back on. I think I'm just hypothesizing here that the weight has to do with the childhood sexual abuse. An example would be, I had a patient, I've had many patients over the years say things like, I restricted because my abuser said that they liked how chubby I was. I get it. I've had people say my uh, abuser, you know, said something about my body, how bony and they liked it. So I put on weight or I thought putting on weight because I have some belief about weight and my body and what that says. I thought by putting on extra weight, it would make me unattractive and then they would stop abusing me. There can be all sorts or Here's another, um, binge eating helps me numb out or binging and purging helps me numb out or get rid of some of the emotions that I experience because they're so uncomfortable, right? So I do that as a way to numb out and that's the only way I know. And when I don't do it, I feel more vulnerable or I feel in general and that's uncomfortable. So it could be any of those reasons why you feel the need to put the weight back on. Having that weight on maybe makes you feel safer, maybe engaging in sexual intimacy is actually kind of triggering and maybe you don't want to do it all the time maybe you wish i don't know maybe you wish you didn't even want to i don't know i'm i'm hypothesizing throwing things out there some of this may land some of it may not but that doesn't sound crazy it's incredibly common and those are just some of the many various reasons why now going to therapy is will definitely help i think he's going to have to be part of it um, the fact that he's cheated is something that you'll have to work on. It sounds like maybe you already have, but if not, there are a lot of, you know, a couple's counselor is going to be really, really helpful. Um, you're going to have to address the fact that you don't feel like he ever wants to be intimate with you. I don't know if that's true or if this has to do with your self-esteem. It could be a little bit of both, but we need to have a safe place to talk about it. We're going to have to dig into these things. I really think that sorting out the root problem, uh, probably healing the childhood sexual abuse. So we have to do some inner child work. I had the inner child workshop available on my website. That could be a place to start. Um, but getting into therapy is going to be helpful for you because we have to process what happened to you as a child and your relationship with food and this yo-yo dieting and this, this feeling that you need to have that weight on. I think, it, like I said, it might be some kind of protection. Um, we're going to have to figure that out. There's no right or wrong answers. We have to be curious, not judgmental about where this comes from, because I believe that all of this is, is like kind of, you know, feeding into one another and pun intended, right? It's all connected. The, the relationship with your husband could be affected by your relationship with yourself, whether we want to admit it or not, it always is, but it also takes two. You're only responsible for 50% of that relationship. He's responsible for his 50%. So he needs to show up for you. He needs to be able to have conversations about your sexual intimacy. Does he, is he interested or not? When he cheated, did he apologize? Do you feel okay? Are you, were you able to build the trust back? 
those are all big questions, right? I have um, videos about like dealing with infidelity that could be really helpful in overcoming it. Um, yeah, I really think that that you getting into trauma therapy is going to be really helpful in healing, doing some of that inner child work. Like I said, the workshop could be a good place to start if you don't have a therapist or can't find one or a little scared to start. The inner child workshop would be a place to start. Um, if you're able to get your husband to come into couples counseling with you, I would encourage you to do that. It doesn't mean forever, but we're going to have to be in there for a while to be able to talk through these things. Um, if you if he's like, no, then you can start your own individual therapy and then maybe bring him in every so often. I'm just going to throw it out there. If he always says, no, no, I'm not going to go to therapy with you. No, I'm not going to participate. At that point, you have to make a decision whether what he's giving to the relationship is enough for you, right? Because it, again, it's only 50, 50. I don't want you taking 90% or a hundred and thinking it's all on you. Every relationship takes each other. It's 50, 50 always. I know. I know it's hard to admit, but it's always 50, 50 and you, you can only clean your side of the street. If that person's still running amok, acting like an asshole, we can't do anything about that, right? We can only clean our side of the street. And so then we have to decide if them running amok and acting like an asshole is okay or not. And if we're going to tolerate it or not, and that's up to you. And that's a choice you get to make and no judgments around it. If it's your, you know, your marriage and you want to make it work, then you do your 50% and you make it work for you. But I, but those are kind of the ways that I would see this, this getting better because we can get you back on track. We just, you just need some support. Can't do it on your own, right? We have some stuff that needs to be worked out. Hence the yo-yo dieting, the self-esteem and the weight. That's all coming from that childhood sexual abuse. And your husband's probably going to need to work with you in the sexual intimacy realm to help you feel okay. I don't know how it is for you, but it sounds like it's a struggle, and I don't know if it's a struggle because you're uncomfortable because of the past abuse or if it's because he doesn't really make you feel wanted. And if you, you know, either or we're going to have to work on that and talk about that and feel okay talking about it. I mean, you've been married for 24 years. I hope you can talk about sex at this point. Um, yeah, it'll get better. Just find someone you really connect with, someone who you feel gets you. Remember, there's lots of bad therapists out there, but there's lots of great ones too. So make sure you find the right fit and work on your own little by little because it can and will get better. Okay. That's it for today, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. We're coming in on uh, Christmas here. So I hope you have, if I don't hear from you, if you don't listen or watch over the holidays, I hope you have a wonderful, happy holiday. Um, I have my boundaries workshop coming up this January. If you're interested, it'll be January. It's the first two Fridays in January. I believe it is the 6th and the 13th. Yes, 6th and the 13th from 1 to 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. We'll be talking about what boundaries are, why they're important, how to put them in place. There'll be worksheets, downloadables, things to help you um, improve that and improve your relationships because boundaries are really important. And trust me, I've done my own fair share of work and therapy on them. So I hope you can join us there. We'll be, I'll be doing Q&A during it and all sorts of things if you can actually attend live, but it will be filmed and will be something that you can access later. Even if you attended live, you can go back and rewatch. Um, you know, maybe you're like, oh, what was that thing she said? You can go back and do that again and listen to it again. Take notes. Okay. I love you all. Have a wonderful rest of your week and I will see you next time. Bye. Ask, Katie.